Welcome back, folks, to WrestleRant, where I give my in-depth analysis of all the pay-per-views that I watch in the WWE Network. Of course, here today, wearing my Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame t-shirt, which I will actually be returning to this weekend in Amsterdam, New York. Very much looking forward to that. But here today, I'll be reviewing the 2006 installment of the Great American Bash pay-per-view, produced by the WWE Live from Indianapolis, Indiana. The 04 and 05 installments were not that great, pretty less than stellar uh, for my full thoughts on those shows. Make sure to go back and check out my reviews of those events right here on the channel. But nevertheless, the 2006 show was known for its card being in, thrown in the state of disarray. Three wrestlers, not one, not two, but three wrestlers in three different matches on this show were canceled from the event, were taken off the card due to a very similar issue. I guess they all suffered the same health issue or what was, what, what was cited to be the same health issue, in being elevated enzymes. I have no idea what that means. I was never great in chemistry or, or um, human anatomy or whatever the hell it is. Um, I, so I have no idea what that means. I've done some research while in the midst of watching the show. After seeing, Because I know the great Kyle Lee t- got taken out of his matchup due to elevated enzymes or a health issue. And I looked it up, and he was taken out due to that reason, as was Bobby Lashley from his matchup, as was super crazy. And I guess some people are just saying it was steroids, and maybe that makes sense, but maybe for someone like super crazy, maybe not so much. But then again, he was, I think, suspended at one point for the wellness policy or for violating it at one point. I think it may be 07 or or, or 08 08 or something like that. Um, But anyway, so that kind of threw the whole show in a state of disarray. They tried to make the most of it, but... Like I said, I'll be giving my full thoughts on the show right now. So kicking off the show, we had a WWE Tag Team Championship matchup between the team of Brian, uh, Brian Kendrick and Paul London against the team of the Pitbulls, Kid Cash and Jamie Noble. Very fun opener. Always loved the tandem of Paul London and Brian Kendrick. I thought they had the potential to be much more than what they were. I mean, they're the longest reigning WWE Tag Team Champions, I believe, in SmackDown history, holding those titles for one year straight. But they had a very good thing going, defending the titles on a regular basis. They had a great set of opponents in Kid Cash and Jamie Noble, an underrated team in my opinion, fan of both guys. Um, A great way to kick off the show, very fun action. Not much of a story told, but I mean, that's really not what these kind of matches were about involving London and Kendrick. It was really kind of all about the action, much like the X Division was, or kind of is to an extent, to TNA nowadays or has been for the last 10 years. But anyway, though. Um, Paul London and Brian Kendrick, like I said before, I think should have achieved much more success than what they did. Like I said, they've had a WWE Tag Team title reign, a World Tag Team title reign over on the Raw brand. But even when they broke up a little over two years later, Paul London, I thought, could have, could have been a breakout single star. Um, much like what Evan Bourne was during his time in the WWE with his shooting star press and getting over on his own. I thought Paul London could have fit into that role quite well. And then he got released in late 2008. And Brian Kendrick obviously became the Brian Kendrick. And he didn't really have much of a future either. I'll probably be doing a Push to Punish article on him on Bleach Report sometime soon. So be on the lookout for that. But yeah, Brian Kendrick really didn't go anywhere. He got a push for the first few months of of a singles career before being let go in the summer of 2009. And despite being good friends with Shawn Michaels, having trained at his school, I guess it didn't really help him in the end. So that kind of sucks. But... Anyway, I digress. Uh, getting back to the point in hand, great match to kick off the show. Very fun contest. Paul London and Brian Kendrick, still your WWE Tag Team Champions. Up next for the United States Championship, it was supposed to be, I believe, a triple threat between Finley, Regal, and Bobby Lashley. Either that, or I think it was just, it was just supposed to be Finley versus Bobby Lashley for the United States Championship. But like I said before, Bobby Lashley was taken out of the matchup due to suffering elevated enzymes or some kind of health issue, whatever. So out comes Teddy Long. Bobby Lashley comes out, says he wants to compete. Teddy Long prohibits him from doing so. And uh, Finley said, well, I just want to defend my U.S. championship anyway. I guess I'm okay or something like that. And Teddy Long says, no, you're going to be defending the title. So not against Bobby Lashley, but against your good friend, William Regal, because at the time they were in that uh, the King Booker stable, uh, whatever they called it, the King's Court, I think was what it was called. So they were good friends at the time, allies, and that kind of um, created tension between the two. William Regal, before this, was never really teasing a babyface turn. Never, he, he never did so after this either way. Um, they were still a unit before and after this matchup. So it was just kind of a one-off thing where they kind of both faced each other with the title on the line. But that being said, though, William Regal as a heel, um, people really didn't have any incentive to cheer one guy over the other. So there was kind of a 
hit and miss to this matchup. The hit was that it was an old, you know, a, a great rivalry from the WCW days. If you go back to the good old days of, of good old days of WCW, um, over the Hardcore Championship, Finley and William Regal had a great series of matches. Um, two of the best veterans in the business, very experienced, legendary careers. Not legendary, but you know, very experienced veterans. Um, so they go a way ways back, and for them to clash almost 20 years later was pretty cool. And uh, over a WWE United States Championship, also had, that has WCW lineage behind it. So that was very cool. I don't even know if the commentators really brushed up on that all that much or mentioned that during the course of this contest. But that was pretty cool. Um, like I said before, the missed part of this matchup was that the fans in attendance really didn't have any incentive to cheer one guy over the other. They hated Finlay. They didn't want to see him as United States champion. And William Regal was a part of the stable. And I, although they went against each other at several points in the matchup, the fans didn't really care. The, the, the matchup itself wasn't really a matchup. It was just kind of a lot of heel shenanigans and cheating and Hornswoggle, who didn't really have a name at the time, and being called the, the Little Bastard by Michael Cole, him interfering at several points in the contest. Just a lot of heel shenanigans and stuff like that. So it was a fun matchup, just a drag-out brawl um, between Finley and Regal, two WCW veterans. So that was very cool. But like I said, the people in attendance really didn't have any incentive to care because both these guys were heels. Finley retained, still your U.S. champion, so it really didn't matter. But I did want to talk about this, though, because while watching this show, while watching Finley's promo, he got a lot of great heat when he came out. Finley is a guy that I think that despite being a veteran in the business, and uh, like with William Regal back in 2008, people were like, oh, you know, he's he's too old, he's too much of a veteran to be you know, world champion at this point in his career. Finley, I think, in my personal opinion, could have been way bigger than what he was in WWE. He got a very good push right off the start in WWE when I think he debuted in 05, um, won the United States Championship, had a number of good feuds with the likes of Batista. By year's end, I believe by the end of 2006, Finley was main eventing pay-per-views over on the SmackDown side of things for the World WWE Championship against guys like King Booker, like Bobby Lashley, against Batista. And um, I, I think they really dropped the ball on Finley going into 2007. He still had a number of good feuds that year. He competed in the Money in the Bank ladder match a number of times. He had a, had a feud with Kane going into the summer of 2007. But when they turned him babyface and did the whole, I guess that was kind of an organic babyface turn, but to go against the great Kali and to do the whole hornswoggle bullshit with Vince McMahon, the illegitimate son storyline, who knows if they never did that storyline with Vince McMahon and the whole illegitimate son thing because it was supposed to be Mr. Kennedy um, from the get-go, but because of the whole suspension thing, they prevented that from happening, unfortunately. But if things were different and that storyline never happened or never happened the way it ended up going, then maybe Finley would have never gone babyface. And I did like Finley as a babyface, but he was a way better heel. And the unfortunate thing about it was that he never actually ended up going back heel after he turned face. He had great mic skills, was very solid in the ring. I think that goes without saying. Had the credentials. Um, he had the heat. This guy was on the rise on the SmackDown side of things, and I very well could I could have very well seen him as world champion by the end of 2006 or even in 2007. Um, like I said, I think they really much, very much dropped the ball on Finley as a heel on the SmackDown side of things, but that really just kind of stood out to me while I was watching this promo on the show. So up next, we had... Gregory Helms against Matt Hardy in a non-title matchup. Gregory Helms was at the time the Cruiserweight Champion, the longest reigning one at that in WWE history. But um, that being said, this was one, another one of those matches where it didn't really have any build-up or any story behind it or anything that really the commentators made mention of. And I got curious about that. So when I was doing the research, the, the background research on the Great American Bash pay-per-view, this installment of it, um, when I found out that Super Crazy was supposed to face Helms, for the Cruiserweight Championship, so that kind of made sense. So Matt Hardy, I guess, was just kind of thrown in this place, and Gregory Helms was being pushed. And it's funny, because for as much as Gregory Helms was pushed over the course of 2007 and 2006 as a Cruiserweight Champion, he was getting over, he was great in the ring. Um, despite all that, and despite clashing with the best of the best on SmackDown, I believe he faced Undertaker at one point, Batista. Despite all that, he was never really in line for any sort of big push on the SmackDown side of things. I'm not saying he could have been a world champion, but easily you could have given him a run with the United States Championship, you know? So that always, that, that was kind of glaring to me, um, you know, just kind of looking back on it. Matt Hardy, and I'll get to Matt Hardy after I talk about this matchup, but 
Um, the matchup itself I thought was very good. Matt Hardy and Gregory Helms in real life are very good friends, dating back uh, you know years back. Um, they even mentioned that in the show on the, saying that they used to be best friends and now that they were enemies. But you know, still to this day, these guys are very, very much good friends with one another. So that probably made the match that much better because they know each other's styles and know each other inside and out. So that made this match very, very good. I enjoyed it. Gregory Helms ended up going over with the roll-up, I think utilizing dirty tactics. Yeah, he did because he pulled the tights or the pants of Matt Hardy, whatever. But Matt Hardy, I wanted to talk about this. Uh, maybe I'm biased just being a Matt Hardy fan. I understand that. But just looking back, I mean, this was only one year removed. I mean, I know I talked about with Finley and all these other retrospective kind of things, but I did want to talk about Finley, or I'm sorry, Matt Hardy here. Um, only one year prior to this was Matt Hardy involved in one of the hottest storylines, literally and figuratively, with Edge and Lita, the whole real life thing about the cheating and Matt Hardy being legitimately released and coming back and that whole feud with Edge going into SummerSlam in the remainder of 2005. He was one of the most beloved and over guys in the company in 2005. And then going into 06, when he was you know, brought over to the SmackDown side of things, when he was brought over to SmackDown brand, they never pushed him. They didn't give him a championship, um, or at least until at least 2007 and 08 when he held the U.S. championship. But timing is everything. They never capitalized off that momentum because after that feud with Edge wrapped up, Matt Hardy basically went nowhere. He had some success, of course. Like I said before, he was tag team champion. He was United States champion, ECW champion. But I think he could have very well been a world champion for SmackDown if they pushed him properly coming out of his feud with Edge in 2005. He went from, like I said before, being the most over guy in 2005 to losing to the Cruiserweight champion at the Great American Bash pay-per-view in 06. So that was really mind-boggling to me why they never did anything more with Matt Hardy. I don't even know if they put him in line for a world championship match at any point during a SmackDown tenure and during this point in time. Which is really strange to me. I mean, he, Jeff, you know, you can argue who's better, probably Jeff, and being the most over and charismatic, most charismatic and whatever. But like I said before, Matt Hardy was freaking over in 2005, and for WWE to not capitalize that, capitalize on that in the proper way, by giving him a run with a championship at any point during the course of 06 after his feud with Edge wrapped up, is just mind-boggling to me. To see him go from the top of the top, you know, the top of the card from feuding with Edge and being one of the best storylines of 2005 because it was real, it was legitimate, to being jobbed out to the Cruiserweight Champion was ridiculous. So I didn't understand that. But anyway, despite the fact that Super Crazy was supposed to be in the slot and this was an impromptu contest, Hardy and Helms would go on the feud and carry on this feud for several more months um, for the remainder of 2006. So going on now, another matchup that was changed. So three matches in a row that were changed due to these health issues um, was Undertaker versus Great Kali in a Punjabi prison match. Those two were feuding, dating back to you know, Kali's debut in the WWE in either April or May or whenever it was. Um, so Kali debuts. He goes after Taker. He beats him at Judgment Day, a big upset victory. The whole story behind this contest, and it's Quite comical looking back on it now because they've been playing this up for years now. And I guess this, this was really when it kind of started. Um, and JBL was talking about, he re referenced this countless times during this matchup. The Undertaker didn't have it in him anymore. He wasn't the same dead man that he was years ago. Um, now that, you know, like I said before, they're playing that up now. The streak is broken and they were playing that up in his feud with Shawn Michaels and Triple H. But that was the whole story behind this feud. But um, despite that, though, backstage they showed Kali and Undertaker brawling and Big Show attacked Undertaker backstage. So they never acknowledged that G great Kali, I mean, he's this intimidating force at the time, one of the most, one of the biggest monsters that WWE had at their disposal at this point in time. They didn't want to, you know, get an out for him, um, give an excuse by saying, oh, he has health issues, he can't compete, like they did with Lashley. They wanted to, you know, make up a storyline reason in saying that, Big Show attacked Undertaker backstage. He gets a match with The Undertaker instead. It was a bit fluky storytelling, a bit fluky logic, but they made the most of it. At least they tried to explain it. So Big Show was in Undertaker's place. The matchup was fine for what it was. The whole Punjabi prison match was a big clusterfuck of a contest. It should have never been invented. Um, they did another one at No Mercy a year later with Batista and Great Kali, and I don't think they've ever done one since, thank God. 
But um, the whole concept of it, the whole doors opening, all that bullshit, it just didn't make any sense, especially for two big-ass guys like Undertaker and Big Show who could fucking step over the bamboo in the first place because they're so big. And just to see them climbing it and there were supposed to be like thorns on the top of the inside cage and despite all the doors closing, Undertaker with with ease climbed over to the first cage. So that was really odd. And the matchup itself, it wasn't terrible. But like I said, just a big clusterfuck of a stipulation. Um, was, have never been, uh, I've never been a fan of the Punjabi prison matchup and thankfully it hasn't been brought back since. It was unique, I'll give you that, but the whole concept of it was just asinine, and that was a glaring example during this contest, because Undertaker and Big Show just do not have the best chemistry for one thing, um, that was evident during their 2008 feud, and that was years later, of course, but I, it just didn't make any sense, at least Big Show had a storyline problem with Undertaker, so it wasn't like Big Show was randomly thrown in this spot, because Great Khali couldn't compete, but um... It just didn't make really any sense because it continued the feud between Kali and Undertaker. Had Undertaker win in the last man standing match, not even at SummerSlam, on an episode of SmackDown. So, and this was one of the main matches of the Great American Mask card. So for WWE to change the stipulation, to change the combatants in the contest, because people really wanted to see Undertaker get his hands on Great Kali. And, um, you know, for them to change the matchup at the last minute without them announcing it ahead of time like they did with Bobby Lashley, it's kind of strange. I mean, the U.S. Championship matchup, the Cruiserweight title matches, were not main focal points of the show. This matchup was, because it was a feud, it was the top feud on the SmackDown brand. So for them to switch out Great Khali and put in Big Show instead, and not really give a proper proper explanation before the pay-per-view went live, I mean, I can't imagine many people bought this pay-per-view to see Khali versus Undertaker in the first place, but... To change it at the literally the last second, I just don't get it. Um, some people probably, very few people could have paid to see the show, to see that matchup, and they were kind of cheated out of their money, and they would get it on SmackDown weeks later. But anyway, that was really weird. Like I said, the best way to sum up this matchup, a clusterfuck of a contest, and just Punjabi prison matchups, no thank you. Just not my forte. <clears throat> just not my cup of tea. But anyway, though, Undertaker emerges victorious there. Great Khali, for some odd reason, starts climbing the cage in the final two seconds of the contest. And the matchup just ended anticlimactically, too. It ended in anticlimactic fashion. Um, Undertaker just jumped on top of Big Show, and the wall fell over, and people didn't really know how to react until Undertaker stood up, and he was announced as the winner. Just really strange. Just really, really odd. So we move on from there to a fatal four-way bras and panties matchup. Of course, it's not a, the Great American Match without a Bras and Panties matchup, I guess, um, featuring Ashley Marasso, Crystal Marshall, uh, Crystal Marshall, uh, Michelle McCool, and Jillian Hall. So a fatal four-way Bras and Panties matchup. I don't really want to go into detail about this. Again, I talked about this in my 04 and 05 review, but it was just kind of demeaning, degrading to women to put them in these Bras and Panties matches up. You know, all the time during this point in WWE, this isn't the Attitude Era. This is 2006, and WWE was still doing these kind of matches on a regular basis. And I'm not complaining. I enjoyed watching it. As a male viewer, I enjoyed watching it. But this kind of shit would not fly in today's WWE with it being PG and in today's world. And like I said, I've said this before in past videos, but it would not fly in today's era and today's society with it being so sensitive and so PC and political, politically correct. You can't pull this kind of shit nowadays. And I'm glad... Oh, I'm sorry. I just kind of fucking messed up the camera there for a second. Um, and I'm glad because... And I'm not saying, oh, I just want wrestling. It's not about sports entertainment. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that... And it was entertaining. I understand that. But it's degrading to women to, you know, to do these bras and panties matchups every single year. It's more the same. It's not even fucking... It is entertaining, I mean, to see women being stripped of their bras and panties, of course. I mean, who wouldn't want to see that? But... It wasn't even much of a matchup. It's just brawling. It's not entertaining. I mean, to see people stripped of their clothing, yeah, that's fun. I mean, to see horny males in the in the front row going crazy for every time someone gets stripped of their clothing, that's hilarious as hell to watch. But the matchup itself is just not entertaining. There's no ma It's not even wrestling. It's just not even. It's not even brawling. It's just women just falling on top of one another. It's just. If you want to see this kind of shit, you just go look up porn or something like that. You know what I mean? Like this is just dumb. So that was really stupid. Ashley came up victorious, and she and Jillian stripped afterwards anyway. They stripped one another, 
and they, I don't know if it was intentional or just looked bad because they, they, she gently pulled off her pants and she helped her out of it. And I don't know if it was supposed to be a surprise. I don't freaking know. This was also a train wreck of a match. Like I said, entertaining to watch as a male viewer, but for WWE to go back to this matchup every single year at this pay-per-view, it's just mind-boggling to me. At least try to make it, you know, I mean, I understand that there's somewhat of a story behind it, and that's good. That's what the Divas are missing nowadays, and we're starting to get back to the era where we have good wrestling and a good mixture of good storytelling, and that's great. But I mean, I'd rather, much rather have matches involving Divas and good matches than bras and panties matchup that mean nothing and it's just entertaining for the male viewers and just degrading to women. So that's that. Up next, we had Batista versus Mr. Kennedy. And this was another matchup that didn't really, that wasn't changed on the spot, but it was changed maybe a week prior. Because here's the thing so, dating back months ago, in early of 2006, Mark Henry inadvertently injured Batista at a live event, forcing him to relinquish the World Heavyweight Championship. Mark Henry went on a reign of terror, reign of terror, reign of terror, what am I saying? Reign of terror in the months um, that followed, and leading to Batista's comeback that summer, they were supposed to face off finally at the Great American Bash pay-per-view, but before they could, Mark Henry was injured at the 2006 Saturday main event tapings in July of 2006. So, because of that injury, he was scheduled to be out for about eight months, and he was. I think he didn't come back until May of 2007, so about ten months, actually. But, um, yeah, so that prevented the matchup from happening, and in Mark Henry's place was Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy was also a star on the rise at the time, a former United States champion. I think he was the champion. No, was no, he was a future United States champion? I can't remember, no. Because Finley beat Lashley for the title. And then Kennedy would win the title a couple months later. That's what it was. Okay. Anyway, though, um, Mr. Kennedy was a star on the rise at the time. But that being said, though, this, real, this matchup really didn't have much meaning behind it. Because like I said before, they switched it out at the last minute. And it was supposed to be Batista versus Mark Henry. Batista's first singles match back from his injury. The first singles match of his, I think maybe of the year. Or, uh, or at least in the last number of months and many, many months. So for Kennedy to take that spot instead, it, like I said, had no meaning behind it. I mean, I know Batista would go on to become the number one contender to the world championship at SummerSlam, and I thought this matchup had the tagline of being that the winner advances to SummerSlam for the world heavyweight championship, but it didn't. It didn't even have that stipulation. This wasn't even a number one contender's matchup. It was just a random match, and it didn't make any sense. So at least with the Undertaker and Muhammad Hassan matchup that we got the year before, and it's funny because... Undertaker won that number one contenders matchup last year for the World Heavyweight Championship and did not get a shot at the world title as he was scheduled to, whereas Batista and Kennedy, this match this match was not a number one contenders match for the world title, yet Batista would get a shot at the world championship anyway at SummerSlam in August, and he lost this match, and Mr. Kennedy won by DQ, and that was another weird thing about it. Batista, first of all, acted like a heel. I understand he was letting out his pent up for frustration. People cheered him anyway. But for him to go on a rampage by attacking Mr. Kennedy and attacking him anyway after the matchup, forcing him to bleed, I know that was inadvertent. Mr. Kennedy has said that in the past. But um, for he acted like a heel on attacking Kennedy relentlessly after the matchup. He lost the matchup via DQ. I don't really know what, how much Kennedy got out of this since Batista would go on to become the number one contender to the world title anyway. And he would attack... Mr. Kennedy after the contest. So this whole thing was just oddly booked. The matchup was good. Don't get me wrong. The match was good and probably one of the better matches of the night. But the, the ending result was weird. I mean, it gave Kennedy a big pro, high-profile victory. But what did it really do for Mr. Kennedy in the end? He would never become a world champion in WWE. Batista would go on to become the number one contender anyway. Batista relentlessly attacked him after this matchup. Like, like a heel. And it was weird, and even JBL pointed that out. And when the heel on commentary is the voice of reason, that's when you know you have a problem. So that was weird. Like I said, a good matchup. I enjoyed it. I'm not, I'm not bashing the match quality by any means. But the ending result was just really confusing. Why it was booked that way, I, I have no idea. Maybe they wanted to protect Batista while at the same time giving a win to Mr. Kennedy. And if that was the case, what would have happened if Henry and Batista had a matchup on the show would Henry have won via DQ? I have no idea. Either way, this is just really, really odd. So we go to the main event for the World Heavyweight Championship. 
Rey Mysterio defending against King Booker after uh, becoming the number one contender to the world title via winning a battle royale. And uh, Chava was saying in Rey Mis- to Rey Mysterio backstage that dreams will come true tonight, kind of foreshadowing the ending of this matchup. So, I don't know. Like I said, I didn't watch it at the time. I'm just watching it now, so that kind of made it predictable. And I already know the re- I already knew the result of this matchup, that Chavo would turn on Rey Mysterio. But to those that watched it live, was it predictable that Chavo would turn on Rey Mysterio? Did they foreshadow it too much to the point where it became obvious? And sometimes predictability isn't always a bad thing. Not not always. Sometimes it is a good thing. And this they did the, they did go about this the right way by having Chavo turn on Rey Mysterio. So he did not look weak in defeat. It took a fucking chair shot to take out Rey Mysterio and a very stiff one at that. I don't know if they just, you know, protected it well enough that it just came off really good. But it looked like Chavo just blasted Rey Mysterio with that chair and it looked horrendous. Not in like horrendous, like terrible way, in a way that it was just like devastatingly bad. Uh, but that being said, though, the matchup between Booker and Mysterio, the matchup between Booker and Rey Mysterio, excuse my botch, um, was good. I enjoyed it. Like, Batista and Kennedy, it was a solid contest. And um, the final few minutes were well done with the suspense, with the referee being knocked out. The people wanted to see Rey Mysterio um, retain his world title. His world title reign was not one of the strongest in recent memory. He lost many of his non-title matches um, and stuff like that. So to take the belt off of him at this pay-per-view was probably the best course of action. It would lead into Rey Mysterio versus Chavo for that SummerSlam pay-per-view. Um, I don't, Actually, I don't even know if they faced off. Actually, did I think they did face off at SummerSlam, and then Mysterio got injured afterwards. That's what it was. So that's what happened with Rey Mysterio um, and Chavo. They would go on to feud in subsequent months before Rey Mysterio was taken out with an injury. They would credit Chavo for being the one that injured him and take him, took him off the shelf. And this would probably be the most ho- high-profile feud that Chavo would be involved with in his WWE tenure. And I'm not saying that Chavo could have become a world champion or anything like that. I'm not saying he deserved to win the world title. Maybe he did. I'm not saying he was world title caliber. But I think, like with everyone else I've said on this show, with Matt Hardy, Finley, Paul London, they could have done more with uh, Chavo Guerrero. He was coming off one of the biggest heel turns in, uh, in recent memory of that year. And he went on to do nothing. He took out Rey Mysterio. I think he might have beat him at SummerSlam. And then they did nothing with him. They didn't even give him the United States Championship later that year. They would have him feud with Chris Benoit, who he was good friends with in real life. So that was a good feud. But they never gave him the championship. They never did anything with him in the year after that, after taking out the former world champions. That was also mind-boggling to me. But King Booker would go on to reign as world champion for the rest of the year, go on to feud with Batista the rest of his history. Um, but he was, you know, on the rise. He was on the rise at the time with this whole King Booker gimmick. So good for him for winning the championship. But um, like I said before, Booker Mysterio, good matchup, shocking heel turn from the well, like for the fans in attendance. I already knew obviously because I knew the result of the matchup going in. But um, it was the, the fans in attendance after seeing it go down did look legitimately shocked. Chavo got great heat from it. A good way to take the title off Rey Mysterio and protecting him in defeat and putting the championship on Booker T to transition into Booker's feud with Batista going into SummerSlam. So that closed off the pay-per-view. Overall, um, I figured that the 06, 07, and 08 Great American Bash pay-per-views would be better than the 04 04 and 05 editions because those editions were just so... Not even... The 04 edition was terrible. The 05 edition was slightly better. And just even looking back, I can't remember the 05 card off the top of my head... But I, I think I would put this show on par with 05, if not worse. Um, this show, I mean, it wasn't the worst thing I've possibly seen as a wrestling fan, but a lot of the matches, due to the hot shot booking and the health issues and the outcomes of a lot of these matches, it just didn't really make much sense to me personally. I did not enjoy it. So we'll just do a brief recap here. Opening tag team title match, fun contest. Check it out. Enjoyed it. Finley Regal. It's not a must-see matchup. It was a fun brawl for what it was for longtime WCW fans and for someone like me that's both a fan of Finley and Regal. But in the long scheme of things, it was pretty forgettable. Helms and Hardy had a very good matchup. I would highly suggest checking that out. Undertaker Big Show skip that bullshit. Um, bras and panties matchup. If you're you know if you're in the mood for seeing women getting stripped, then that's the matchup for you. Otherwise, skip that one. Mr. Kennedy Batista. Decent matchup, but the ending result was really odd. The main event was good, too. 
newsworthy in a crowning of a new world heavyweight champion. But overall, another lackluster pay-per-view. I don't know if it was the Great American Mass Stigma after WWE took it over. I know it was a classic event back in the WCW days, and I'm not assuming at all that it's always been a bad event. But after watching these three pay-per-views, the Great American Mass 04, 05, and 06 installments, they've all been lackluster, mediocre, and just flat-out bad. Um, so hopefully the 07 edition will be better when I review that next week and when the 08 edition follows suit the following week. So this is the, those are the next two videos that you can expect to see me review here on the channel. So make sure to tune in for those in the weeks ahead. Always appreciate you guys checking out the videos. The full videos and full list of pay-per-views that I will be reviewing for the next few months are currently up on my website, nextairwrestling.weebly.com. On the homepage, just scroll down all the way to the bottom, and they are right there. So if you want a full list of the pay-per-views, I will be reviewing um, right here on the channel in, in upcoming months, upcoming weeks. Go check that out. But as always, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. All support is greatly appreciated. Like I said before, I'll be back next week with a review of my 2007, with, with my review of the 2007 Great American Match pay-per-view. I'm Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch you guys down the road.